Acts chapter 20, if you have your copy of God's Word, go there. Um, Today we're talking about caring for the blood-bought church. So last week, in our absence of power, and in our absence of air conditioning, and in our absence of lights, we talked about Um, We talked about what it meant to encourage one another. We talked about how the gospel is our greatest encouragement. In fact, go ahead and look at your neighbor and tell them the gospel is their greatest encouragement. The gospel is good. Paul tells the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, for the message of the cross or the gospel, the gospel is foolishness. For those who are perishing or for those who are lost and aren't looking for God, it's foolishness. It sounds outlandish. It says, but for those of us being saved, what's that word it says? It is what? Power. Again, you didn't know it was a pop quiz. You were hot last week. You forgot. So it's the power of God unto us, and it's the message of the cross. So so we continue today, and we start talking about what does it mean to care for the church? I've always been a church guy. I, I've loved the church. Um, I, I took a different route in my seminary journey. Um, a lot of guys just try to go, they go straight from an undergrad to a graduate degree, and they just marathon it out, try to get it over with as soon as possible. I couldn't do that um, because I've always struggled with the concept of I, I need to know what this thing is like. So I started full-time ministry um, my freshman year of college and have never really Look back. I, I, that's why when people ask me, how long have you been in seminary? And I tell them, like, 15 years. Like, it's taken me a little longer because I wanted to be a part of the church more than I wanted to be a seminarian. And I've always had a passion for the church much greater than academia. Uh, people ask me, are, are you going to get your doctorate and teach seminary? And the answer is a resounding no. No. I can't wait to get out of that place. Um, It's not that I don't love what I learned. It's that I would rather be practicing it in the church than sitting in a classroom. That's just I'm I'm wired a little a little differently. I'm the guy that sits in class, going, "How is this going to help my people walk closer to the Lord?" And and I've learned that over 15 years. So professors hate that. And so. So I love the church, and I love being a part of the church, and it's more than a vocation for me. It's a life commitment. Um, I I wake up and I serve the church in areas that that are not part of my job description. I I do things that are not part of my job description as your pastor. I do them because I love the church. I I love the the full entity. I love the, the congregation that meets here, but I love the universal church. I love reading about what God's doing in other parts of our world. I love, love hearing stories of how the gospel continues, and despite the greatest attempts on it to stop it, you can't stop it. It's like when I was a kid um, growing up on the farm. One day, my dad thought it was a great idea, one windy summer day, to, uh, to light the hay field and burn it off, something that you do on the farm periodically. You light it, burn it off. It gets rid of, of a lot of that undergrowth, and it, it just makes grass come out much cleaner next year. And so one day he does that, and we're sitting there kind of watching him do this from afar because it's dangerous to watch up close. And about the time he lights it, it starts going, and he's got it timed just right. Well, in West Alabama in particular, the, especially on the farm, the winds are, are bad for kind of swirling. Like At one point, the wind's hitting you in the face. Next thing you know, it's hitting you in the back. So he's got it primed just right like he likes it, and then the wind changed. And you weren't ready, and it went woof. And there it went all the way across the property. It was this mass chaos, pandemonial, trying to get that thing stomped out. And so, like, sometimes life is unpredictable, and sometimes church is unpredictable. And despite the greatest efforts to stomp that fire out that day, the world is trying very diligently to stomp out the gospel. But every time they stomp it down, it flashes six feet further somewhere else. And you're not going to stop the Holy Spirit. You're not going to stop the king of glory. The gospel will go forth, and we're seeing that in our day. I love the church. Sometimes, though, the church needs caring for. Jesus is our our shepherd. He's our great shepherd. Even as your pastor, I'm not your your shepherd. I'm the under-shepherd. I don't lead, I follow. And I lead by following. And anytime you get a pastor who thinks he's bigger than Jesus, you've got a handle and you've got a mess. Today we're going to talk about what it means to practically care for this thing we call church. How does each member, because what we believe here at Palmerdale Cross is that every member is a minister. You're part of our team of ministering. Because I'm one person and I've got a staff of six other people. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot minister 
to every single one of our flock. There's over 200 in our active worship, and we got a lot more than that on record. I cannot minister to every one of you the way you need to be ministered to. There's too many of you, and there's not enough of me. So every member then becomes a minister, and we care for one another. What I tell people all the time is that you're not alone. You've got an entire church of people here pulling for you, praying for you, and we're here to encourage you. So the Apostle Paul gets into this place in Acts where he starts unpacking that. If you found your place in Acts 20, we're going to start in verse 17. It says, now Miletus, now from Miletus he sent on to Ephesus and he called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to them, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, with trials that happened to me and the plots of the Jews, and how I did not shrink away from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there except for the Holy Spirit testifies in me in every city that imprisonment and inflictions await for me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish the course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care about for the church of God, for which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I command you to God and to these words of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel, for you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, in all things, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, We must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed among all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul, they kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. They accompanied him to the ship. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that in this time, in this space, in this moment, your, your grace would fall, your mercy would be evident. Father, we thank you so much for how you love us, for how you care for us. We thank you, Father, that your, your name is good and that your grace is outstanding. Your mercy was new when we woke up. So God, let us experience you today. And it's in the name of Christ, I pray and believe. And all of God's people said, amen. So what we want to understand about caring for the blood-bought church is that it's something we must be doing. It doesn't skip you. It's like the Great Commission. Caring for the people of God did not skip generations. In fact, it it continues. If you've been saved, then, then now you look inward and go, how can I build this up? How can I make this a structure that is sound and that is developmentally good? First of all, we want to look at Paul's example of caring. Look at what he says in verse 18. Look at what he tells the elders that when he gets there, he says, and, and he came to them, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot 
in Asia. He identified with them in their community. Part of loving the church, part of loving your community is saying, I am here with you. You don't have to look up. I'm not on a pedestal. I am in the trenches with you. I am doing ministry with you. I'm not just talking about it. I am doing it. That's why one of the things that that I've tried as your pastor this year is to make sure no one has more names on the back wall than I do. I want to be the forerunner in gospel conversations in this church. I'm going to share the gospel because I cannot ask you to do it if I'm not willing to walk with you. Our staff is there with me. You, we cannot ask you to press forward in gospel conversations with our city if we're not there behind you saying we're doing it too. So we, he identified with the community saying, I am you. I am part of you. This is our place. This is our home. And we're going to minister well together. We're, you're not on an island. You're here with the church. But also notice that he served the Lord with humility and tears. He says that several times. He says, I've been with you and, and I've come and I didn't come with all of my knowledge. Know that anytime the apostle Paul walked into a church, he's the smartest guy in the room. He's the smartest guy in the room. And yet when, when you read in Ephesians and when you read in Acts and, and when you read in 1 Corinthians, he says, I chose to know nothing except Jesus. Jesus Christ and him crucified. He didn't come in with his wisdom. He didn't come in with his intellect. He didn't come in with his pedigree. And yet he says, I've come knowing nothing except Jesus and him crucified. There's no excuse for the church to be silent. You don't have to be the greatest theologian of all time to share your gospel. What you have to know is the gospel and then share it often. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Share how God came into your life, transformed Formed who you are, and now you get to walk different because of your inheritance and because of your name change. I love so much the fact that when I gave my heart and life to Jesus, he took it forever and he changed me from the inside out. He changed me from the inside out. The next day when I got up from the day I got saved, I didn't wake up with a glow. I, I, I didn't wake up with a halo. It wasn't the wings attached to these big old so- shoulders. It had to be big wings. None of that was there. But my heart was changed inwardly. And then that began to radiate out. Look at what he says in in verse 19. He says, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with the trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. He says, "I, I served you. I was humble about it. And I wept. We live in a generation where tears are seen as weakness, don't we? We live in a generation where tears are often, especially among men, where tears are often seen as weakness. And there's a Greek word for that. It's called hogwash. Adrian Rogers, before he died, said the greatest mishap in the American church today is that we don't have any more tear-stained altars. We've quit weeping for our community. We've quit weeping for lost people. We've quit weeping for families who are walking through trials and troubles. We quit doing that, and we became this polished professional museum of saints instead of the hospital for the broken that we were intended to be. No one looks at us like we've got it all together, because we don't. I mean, who in here is ready to jump up on a stage and let your life be shown for everyone? None of us, right? We we, we would shriek, and we'd be afraid of that. And, And we're not perfect, we're forgiven. You're not perfect, you're, you're forgiven. And that doesn't give you a pass to just keep sinning. On the contrary, what it does is it, it builds us up to know that I am trying to walk in righteousness every day. I am giving my life over to the Lord and every step I take is, is ordained by him and, and we hope we get it right according to the Holy Spirit in our life. We don't walk around with pride, we walk around with humility. We don't look at people's mess and go, good luck. We should weep for them. Your heart should break when the people of God are hurting. Your heart should break when you have brothers and sisters walking through trials. Your heart should break when you find someone who is apart from Christ and they have no desire to know him. That's what should break your heart. But we're men's men, right? No crying in baseball, right? We were taught to be tough. Most of the time, the only reason we cry is when we watch them soldiers coming home videos. Well, they get me every time. Every time, especially when like little kids run up to them, I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it. People come in my office, what's wrong? My allergies. My allergies are messing up. 
we've come to this place where we don't like to show weakness, but part of being humble is being transparent. Part of, uh, part of humility is transparency. That we're not putting on this fake facade because we can dress the cow up, but at the end of the day, it's still a cow, right? You can put lipstick on the pig, but it's still going to go oink, oink and run for the mud. In fact, there's a mud puddle right behind the car where we parked the car in the church parking lot thanks to this great construction we've got going on. And when I got out, Caleb looked at it, and as any three-year-old boy does, he went, whoo. I said, no, sir. No, sir. I will spank you. I, I mean, I will tell you no in this parking lot. And I said, we don't play in the mud. And he said, only pigs play in mud. And I said, yes, sir. Not Caleb's pigs. I had to clarify because he, he had that look. He had that look about him that I was like, uh-uh, no. If we're going to be transparent, if we're going to be clear, what we've got to show the warts and everything. We can't just paint it up. Sometimes church is muddy. Sometimes life is difficult. And instead of hiding that behind dress clothes and makeup, we need to walk in saying, guys, I'm struggling. Because part of caring for the church is being able to be cared too. I remember a couple of seasons in life, see, as a pastor, I hate being a burden on you. I, I hate that. I hate when people are like, let me do, no, don't do anything for me. I, I, I'm good. I hate that feeling. And that's sin on my part, by the way. That's not on you. That's pride on my end. Uh, but there was a, a moment in mine and Katie's life a couple of years ago where we got devastating news and had to go through some things as a, as a married couple that were just tragic and, and hurt and hard and and we got to see the best of God's people. It was the first time ever that I had been in the hospital and somebody had visited us. And I had been on the other end of that for, for decades. But it was the first time in my life that somebody walked in the door to pray for us. It was the first time in my life that people had knocked on our door and said, hey, we brought you dinner. It was the first time in our life that people came by and said, I don't need anything. I'm not staying, but just a second. I just want to put my hands on you and pray. It was the first time in my life that I had experienced the opposite side of pastoral care. It was the first time, and, and it wasn't the pastor doing that. It was the people of God who understood that they had a family of God who was hurting, and they wanted to be there for them. They wanted to be there with them. They wanted to be an encouragement. We should be people who walk in humility and weep for the things that breaks God's heart. But then notice what he does. As very Pauline, in, in 20 and 21 of this passage, he shares the gospel. He shares the gospel. Look at, look at what he says, because the Apostle Paul certainly understood the gospel. This is what he said. He said, I did not shriek away from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, so I'm going to care for you because I'm going to share the gospel with you. The best thing you can do for your brothers and sisters in Christ is to share the gospel with them. Tell them the good news. Tell them the great news that, hey, don't forget, there's a God who loves you. Don't forget, you're walking through this trial, but there's a God who has paid your sin debt, who has allowed you to come and to walk with him, who has given you a new name, and one day will give you an inheritance. We don't shriek away from that. We embrace it. We run towards it. Not away from it. Share the gospel. But Jeff, they're already saved. It's not a one-time message. It's a continual message of life. We share the gospel. Here the elders have come in and Paul has just given them devastating news. He says, this is the last time you're going to see this face. This is it for me. I'm going towards Jerusalem. I'm leaving Ephesus and I'm going to die. This is his death march. He knows he's not coming back. And he says, so make sure you see this because you won't see this face again. How confident is he in the Lord Jesus Christ? The Apostle Paul knows. He, he says, the Spirit has, has encaptured me, and the work of the gospel has surrounded me. I must go. But Paul, they're going to kill you. I, nothing in my life is valuable. This is bone, skin, and blood. It's not valuable when you come to the gospel. See, I think one of the greatest issues we have is we like ourselves way too much. We like ourselves a lot, right? We got Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. If you're still on MySpace, you're one of 10 people. 
We've got all of these things that we use to amplify our lives. We like people to know that we're doing it big. We like people to know that we got it on the high life. We like people to know that look at what I'm eating, look at, what I, look at where I'm at, look, I just hiked a mile, look at all these things. We, we like people to know that because we want to live this elevated lifestyle because we really like us. We really like us, and if you're not careful, you become your own God. And, and can we just be honest this morning and say we make crummy gods? We make horrible gods. I mean, just think about if you had the power of God, how bad you'd have messed it all up by now. I mean, just imagine if you got it at the beginning of this service till right now, you've had it 36 minutes. Imagine how bad you would have it messed up right now. I mean, the whole thing would be off the rails. You'd be looking at God Almighty going, uh, this was on you, big dog. You gave it to me. I don't know what to do. We're, we're not built to be God. We're built to be servants. Next, he, he lived by the Spirit and he treasured Jesus. See, part of caring for the church is being in tune with God. Carrie made it funny when he was singing his song because he started in the wrong key. He probably could have managed that. But it would have sounded awful until the other instruments realized he was in a different key. Because if somebody's in the wrong key, you get that nails on the chalkboard sound, you know what I'm talking about? That part that kind of gets your whole body tensed up. It doesn't take but one string on a guitar being off and you go, ugh. Something's wrong. Like even non-musician people go, no, that's not right. Start over. Like it doesn't take much. Like, well, like we get it. One, one, one finger on the wrong key. You know, one, one, one thing goes south on the piano. Joey gets lost in bass lamb. One thing goes south, and, and it's all, you're in a handle, right? Because that's how music works. Well, to care for the church, you've got to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. You can't just be bouncing around being your own God and expect, wait, I'm going to be a force for Jesus. You see, some of you need, need to hear from the Lord. Some of you need, need to hear the voice of the Lord and, and find out the rhythm that the Holy Spirit is operating in and, and go there. Don't forge your own way. Follow the Lord. The Apostle Paul treasured Jesus and was in tune with the Spirit, but he also served with a clear conscience. What of my grandmother's many sayings was people with clear consciences sleep better. They sleep better. You don't lay up at night worrying about what you said or worrying about that you've done the wrong thing. You get to go to bed early and sleep well. The Apostle Paul says in verse 25, he says this, And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I'm about to go out claiming the kingdom of God will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all. That's some unique language for us. The Apostle Paul says, I'm innocent for the blood of all. This is what he's saying. He's saying that the people the Lord has put in front of me, I have done what the Holy Spirit has called me to do. Have you ever been somewhere and you felt the Holy Spirit tug on your heart? Have you ever been somewhere and you felt God called you to say something, to speak up, to do something? To tell, to tell them about the gospel, to share with them the good news? And you kind of backed away from it? Have you ever been there? H have you ever failed that Holy Spirit test? The Apostle Paul is saying, the people whom God has placed in front of me, I have shared the gospel with. I don't have to go to bed tonight fearing that they're not going to make it to heaven because I've shared truth with them, I've lived truth with them, and I've encouraged them to do the same thing. See, part of what we are as ministers of the gospel is we are people who God puts us in a place for our surroundings. Have you ever thought that you know the people you know because God has placed you there for a moment in which you can share the gospel? You may be the only saved person in your office. God put you there for a reason. Not to be an undercover agent, but to be someone who will testify about Jesus. Someone who will encourage people with the gospel. Can we, can we be honest this morning and say there's not a lot to be encouraged about in our world? Can we, can we pull back the curtain and, and show truth this morning and go in and, and the way the world is going and in the, the drumbeat that it's our country especially is taking, there's not a ton to be overly excited about, right? Like nobody's jumping up and going like, we're killing it. Yes. Woo. Everybody loves each other. We've got it going on. No, it's, there, there's this underfeeling of, of total dissension in our world. Like we would argue over what color these chairs are. 
They're gray. They're black. They're orange. How do you think they're orange? Right? We would, we would come to a place where we just we argue, and yet there's something very special about knowing I have done exactly what God has placed on my heart. I have fulfilled the calling that the Holy Spirit put on me. And, and what the Apostle Paul says is, is, I am free from the guilt of the Holy Spirit because I've acted well before the Lord. I have done what he's called me to do. So I don't have to fear a world going to, to hell because I've been faithful. But then he says to the elders, he says, watch yourselves. Look at the warning he gives. He tells them. He says, he says, watch yourselves in verse 28. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Now, why would the Apostle Paul say, watch yourself? Growing up, again, on a farm, the term watch yourself meant something different for me. Um, I remember the first time I heard it, I was, uh, I was at a deer processing place, and this big old boy who had just gutted the deer that we were sitting by um, grabbed the hose pipe, and he said, watch yourself. I didn't know what that meant. So I'm standing there by, on the opposite side of him. Nothing's between me and him but the deer. And he's got the water hose. And he says, watch yourself. Now I know that means you need to get out of the way. But I didn't know that at like seven years old. I, I was like, watch yourself. I'm like, I like what I see. I, I didn't know water was coming. I didn't know. But I quickly learned I'm getting wet. I didn't know. When he says, watch yourself, he's not telling you to move. Water's coming. He's saying, watch your heart. Watch the things that you begin to love and the things you begin to do. Watch what you're doing because we are quick to stumble. We are quick to lose focus. The, the hymn that we love so much says, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. We're, we're prone to wonder. We're prone to wonder. God made a bunch of ADD kids, right? We, Lord, I'm following you. Ooh, a light. Ooh, look at that. Lord, I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm right. But look at that. Shine like new money, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're a lot like, ladies, we're a lot like your husbands. I want you to picture this. You're riding down the road, and, and if your husband's a car guy, and that classic car goes by that he's had his heart set on for decades, goes by, and you're talking to him, and he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, he'll put your car in the ditch watching another one. That's what we do as the children of God if we're not careful. If we lose the focus of who Christ is, we become little distracted children hyped up on sugar. We're just bouncing from thing to thing, trying to find something that satisfies us, and yet what we find is nothing really satisfies us except God. And he's the first person we left. He says, watch yourself, but then he says, watch the flock. He's, he's, tell, he's talking to the elders in Ephesus, and he says, he says, watch the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you the overseer of to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Part of the weight of pastoring is that very thing. Like part of the weight of pastoring is realizing what I'm ministering to, what I'm trying to lead was paid for by Jesus, was paid for by Jesus. Can you imagine the, the, the gift that you have in your home? I'm talking about the one that if the house is on fire, the one thing you run back in for besides your kids and, and maybe your dogs, all right? Um, I'm talking about the one thing that you say, I've got to, that, that's irreplaceable, that one thing that you have. Maybe it's a, a picture. Maybe it's an heirloom that maybe you, your granddad or grandma gave you. Uh, maybe, maybe it's something along those lines, and it's the most cherished thing you have. It's something that, that you love, and imagine that that was given to you by Jesus, and that's the weight that pastors feel as we try to do this thing called church, as we try to do this thing called ministry. We understand it, it's not my ministry. It's not my church. My name isn't on the deed. It, none of that. It belongs to Jesus. You, you are his flock. You are his people, and I'm just his under-shepherd. And the weight of that sometimes gets heavy. So the Apostle Paul says, remember that Jesus bought the church. What did he use for currency? His blood. Jesus died so that the church could exist. So you and I get to come to a comfortable room with air conditioning, sing the gospel, hear the gospel. Why? Because Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all, and all to him we owe. So he gives them the warning, but then he says, Look at how I live the gospel in my life. Verse 36 through 38 gives us some truths about how the Apostle Paul operated in his life and what he tried to do. He 
says, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. So the apostle Paul begins to leave. And instead of just walking out and, and saying, good luck, they have a moment of prayer. The apostle Paul knew all too well that following Jesus was not easy. So he avoided greed. He, he said, I don't count my life of any value. He said, I didn't covet your silver or gold or your apparel. He said, I, I ministered with hard work. I gave my time, and he practiced generosity. You want a secret to godly living? Avoid greed, work hard, and practice generosity. See, believers in Christ should never be closed fist people. We should be open-handed. What I have is yours because what God has given to me is enough. I don't have to have this couch. If you need my couch, you can come get my couch. If, if God's put it on your heart to come get my couch, come get it. I'm not going to stop you. Um, you come, come get my banana pudding and we may wrestle, but the couch is good. He practiced generosity. He, he gave his life away, but he also gave his wealth away. And he loved the people of God. Look at this sorrowful. So, so they pray. There was much weeping on part of all. They embraced Paul and they kissed him, being sorrowful mostly because of the words that he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. I love that it tells us that the men of God broke down and cried. I love that the Bible tells us that they had strong emotional responses to the Apostle Paul leaving. You say, well, Jeff, these are just his buddies. No, there's something special that happens when the church comes together. You see, you can live life on the fringes of our church. If the only time you show up for church is at the 1030 hour, you're not invested, you're not involved, you don't serve, then odds are you're, you're missing what it feels like to be a connected member of this body. As I tell people all the time, some of the greatest things we do, they don't happen on Sunday morning at 1030. They happen on, on a Tuesday morning meeting with our senior adults. It happens in a Wednesday night Bible study where the Holy Spirit speaks in new ways. They happen over a cup of coffee when five or six people drop by just to see how we're all doing. Because that's when the people of God are caring. I'm not saying you're not caring now. I'm not saying you don't like the people you're sitting next to. But what I am saying is, if you're not plugged in, you're, you're, you're missing out. You're missing out. The church is a beautiful thing that God created. A bunch of people didn't get together and be like, hey, why don't we just start getting together and, and we'll brew coffee and, and turn the air conditioning on and have a good time. That wasn't how the thing started. It, it started by the people of God under the direction of the Holy Spirit got together. They broke bread. They read the word together. And then they realized, man, this is sweet. Man, there's nothing better than we can do than to share experiences with, together and with the Holy Spirit. And then they realized something special. So Jeff, what was so special? They realized they were better together than they were apart. They realized they had more power together than they had apart. And they realized something very unique and very special. They realized that everybody in the room were fighting the same demons. See, we like to dress it up and act like we've got it together. We come into church with our best on and we're our most behaved. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been in an elevator. Pastor Jim's been in an elevator. Pastor Donnie, Pastor Ron, we've been in places. And we hear just some of the filthiest language that man has ever come up with. Sounds like we got on an elevator with a bunch of sailors and truck drivers at a convention. And then they look at us, what do y'all do? We're pastors. Well, we'll praise God. First time you've mentioned his name in that kind of light. Okay. What they realized was 
as they gathered together to be the church, something special happened. Something special happened. They realized they weren't alone. They realized that everybody has sin. They realized that everybody was in the trenches. And they found a way to be there for each other. Can I ask you a question this morning? How are you caring for the people of God? The Apostle Paul tells them, you're not going to see my face again. The Holy Spirit has led me to Jerusalem, and I know this is going to be my demise. I know this is going to kill me, and I love that the Apostle Paul still went. If some of you got a text right now saying, don't go to Birmingham, you'll die there, you would avoid Birmingham like the plague. But the Apostle Paul hears the Holy Spirit say, you're going to Jerusalem. This is not going to end well, but you're still going to go, and he gets on the boat to go. Why? He was built up by the church. He was encouraged by the church, and he had the gospel. And he said, I count my life as nothing. What do you count your life as? Is it the nothing like the Apostle Paul, or is it something? What are you doing with the people of God? Some of you can't encourage the people of God because you're not saved. And you know that try to encourage something that you're not a part of would be in vain. So today the invitation for you is, Come give your life to Jesus. Some of you today realize, man, I, I'm not walking well. The Apostle Paul's willing to give up his life and die like that, but I'm, I'm struggling with my self-worth, and I've got myself elevated, and, and you know that's sinful. There's an altar you can come deal with the Holy Spirit. Some of you today, and you, you hear this, and you realize, I'm not encouraging. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going the other way. I'm prone to discourage. And we, we are, like, this, this Burger King generation that we live in, where we can have it our way, makes us pretty critical of everything else, doesn't it? Like, I can't tell you how many times I've driven by people's houses. They'd be like, I don't know why they did that. Well, they didn't ask me, nor did I pay for it. Why do I care? This is the kind of world we live in. Why'd they build it like that? Why'd they paint it that color? Look at those shutters, right? Like, we'll get all bossy like that, like we own the place. This is what our world does to us. And yet we should be the people of God who go, Lord, how do I care for people? I don't care what color their shutters are. How do I care for people? I don't care what color their skin is. How do I care for people? How do I build up the church and not squash it down? How do I encourage with the gospel? I pray the Holy Spirit presses on your heart. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the ministry of the Apostle Paul who challenges us, who, who, who tells us that our lives are worth giving up when it comes to the gospel. God, I pray over everyone under the sound of my voice this morning, everybody in this room, Lord, if there's sin they need to confess, Lord, that your spirit would challenge them to do that. God, if, if there's something in their heart they need to surrender, God, if they've been, if they've been critical instead of encouraging, may they find a place of repentance. May we all guard our hearts and, and not be great critiquers, but instead be great encouragers. As the Apostle Paul himself said, said he operated for the building up of the church, not for tearing it down. So, Father, we, we pray for the people today that need to be built up, that you'd build them up. They're fighting doubt, as they're fighting fear, fighting financial issues, fighting against sin, fighting against relationships, fighting against different things that are out there that you allow your bride to fill them up. God, that, that we'd be people of encouragement. For those that, who need to trust you today as Savior, God, I pray that your grace would flood their life and they would say yes to you. It'd say yes to the great I am. It'd say yes to the king of all days. It'd say yes to the king of kings. God, I pray that if somebody's struggling with that, you'd give them the courage to come down, grab one of our leaders and talk about Jesus. Whatever you need to do during this invitation, we give you full authority, full power. 
And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and we believe. And all God's people said, will you stand and sing with us?